With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. It's been called the most famous Christmas tree in the world. For the better part of a hundred years, the annual lighting of the tree in New York's Rockefeller Center has become a Christmas tradition, not only for this country, but for viewers around the world. An estimated 125 million people visit the Big Apple to see all 75 feet of this gorgeously illuminated giant Norwegian spruce. Meanwhile, the nation of Brazil boasts the largest Christmas tree in the world. Since 1996, this gigantic floating Christmas tree is on a barge in a lake right outside of Rio de Janeiro, and it it, it clocks in at over 275 feet tall, taking more than 3 million lights to illuminate that artificial tree. And yet here in Matthew's opening chapter, there's a tree unlike any other. It stands taller than the Swiss Alps. It shines brighter than the noonday sun. And it has attracted billions upon billions of people with its message of hope, grace, and redemption. It's the genealogical record, the Christmas family tree of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as I just give you a topical message based on these 17 verses tonight, I want us to gaze upon what we might call the very first Christmas tree. And to paraphrase the Christmas classic, I think when we're done, my prayer at least, is that when we are done, you will sing along with the old songwriter, O Christmas tree, O Christmas tree, how lovely are thy branches, how brilliant is thy light, how gracious are your gifts. Three simple things I want you to notice tonight about this family Christmas tree. Number one, the marvel about the folks on the tree. I mean, if you know your Bible well, if you know Old Testament history, when you, when you read through these names, there, there is an amazement. There's an awe and a wonder. We, we might join in the old song, How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me, that some of the folks that got in the family line of Jesus got in the family line of Jesus. Several years ago, I was with Pastor Don Hathaway at the Southern Baptist Convention as we were walking through the hallways and viewing some of the exhibits. I saw across the way, and you know how these big convention centers can be, I, I saw sort of across the way a, a man about my age that reminded me of a guy that I went to college with. I even commented to Pastor Don, I said, you know, that old doppelganger thing that everybody supposedly got a twin? That guy over there, man, he looks so much like this guy that I went to college with. But the guy that I went to college with was not exactly what you'd call a Christ follower. Picture those teenage college frat movies. That was him. It never occurred to me that that's actually who it was. Until a few months later, a mutual friend of ours, we were talking and he said, you'll never guess who I ran into on an airplane headed to the Southern Baptist Convention. I said, do tell. He named this guy. I said, he got gloriously converted in graduate school left that profession, called to the ministry. He's serving on staff at a Southern Baptist church. I thought, I, it didn't even occur to me that it could have been the same guy. How did a guy like that get in a place like this? My flawed assumption was really akin to the critics of the man born blind. You remember him in John chapter 9? There had been such a radical change. Folks said, I don't think that's him. Just somebody kind of looks like him. But when we come to the opening of Matthew's gospel, I get much the same sentiment. People who, when we first saw them, when we first met them in the pages of Old Testament Scripture, we would have never thought they could have made it into the redeemed line of the people of God. 
One writer comments that Jesus was sent by God of grace to be a king of grace, and the people he chose to be his ancestors reveal the wonders of his grace and give hope to all sinners. Now, our question tonight ought to be, how do sinners like that get on a list like this? And more personally, how do sinners like us get on a list like that? I mean, so that when the roll is called up yonder, we'll be there because when we're there, our name is on the roll. I'm talking about being amazed by the people that can get in the family of the Lord Jesus. Perhaps you've heard the little poem. It says, I dreamed about death the other night and heaven's gates swung wide. With kindly grace, an angel stood and ushered me inside. And there, to my astonishment, stood folks I'd known before. Some I had judged and labeled unfit for heaven's door. Indignant words rose to my lips, but never were set free. For every face showed stunned surprise. No one expected me. Well, I don't know everybody's name on heaven's roll, but I'm sure there'll be some surprises of who's there and who's not. But none will be any more shocking than some of the names we read in this genealogical role in Matthew chapter 1. Why should we marvel about the folks on the tree? Two, two simple things, and I'll do my best to be brief tonight. First, they were converted by God's mercy. They were converted, that is, they were transformed, changed, and redeemed by the mercy of God. Now, there's some scoundrels and ne'er-do-wells on this list, and it's just a reminder that even the Lamb of God had some black sheep in his family. You've got some in yours. Someone has said that Christmas is the time that all the family gets together once a year just to remind us that once a year is far too frequent. I'm talking about sharing the supper table with liars and thieves and low-down good-for-nothing. Sorry, people, but, but enough about Andrea's side of the family. I came tonight to talk about the family line of Jesus. Now, you know some of these names. Some of them are famous, we might say infamous sinners from the Old Testament narrative. There's Abraham who was a liar, lied to save his own skin, even at the expense of sacrificing the dignity of his own wife's honor. Abraham, who had an adulterous detour with Hagar, the handmaiden, and not only did he disobey God, but his disobedience opened the door for polygamy and all sorts of uh, ungodly practices for the nation of Israel. In this text, we find Jacob, the deceiver, who deceived his father and all of his family. There's Judah, who fathered his own grandson with his daughter-in-law. And I I remind you, his excuse is that he thought he was hiring a prostitute. And by the way, that pretentious prostitute, Tamar, she's in the list too. And then there's Rahab. We commonly call her Rahab the harlot. Prior to her salvation, she knew the men of the city of Jericho in the worst imaginable way. Selling her body for hire, who would have ever thought we'd see her in the bloodline of the immaculately conceived son of the living God? Then we read reference to Ruth, a Moabitess no less. A descendant and member of a tribe of people that were so forsaken by God because of how they treated Israel during the exodus out of Egypt, in part because of how their very uh, tribe and bloodline was conceived on a drunken bed of incest by Lot and his two Sodomite daughters. Not exactly the kind of woman that you would expect to see in the bloodline of our Lord. Though Matthew does not name her, he references Bathsheba that David the king begot Solomon through the one who had been the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, females were not typically listed in genealogical records, but if you were going to list some, these weren't exactly the first ones you might think to include. By the way, do you know the difference between these sinners that I just named and all the other sinners that are on this list, because everybody on this list except Jesus, they're all sinners in need of a Savior. Do you know the difference between the famous sinners and, uh, and the secret sinners on this list is the same difference between the famous sinners of our day and the secret sinners of our day, and that is some people's sins are known and other people's are not known. But all of us get onto the list of the, the family of Jesus converted by God's mercy. 
Through the years, I've heard a lot of well-intentioned preachers say that God won't use a dirty vessel. I know what they mean by that, and I am certainly in favor of right, close, clean, sanctified living. You know me well enough to know that. But listen, dear friend, God has to use dirty vessels. That's the only kind that He has to work with. Thankfully, He cleans us by His grace. He washes us in His blood and places us in His family and by His mercy uses us for His glory. So we should marvel about the folks on this family tree. Number one, they were converted by God's mercy. Secondly, they were connected to God's Messiah. That's really the common thread that that weaves all of this family together. There There are a few people in this list that we know, but truthfully, most of them are unknown to us, and you prayed, fasted, and interceded while I tried to work my way through all of the pronunciations of those names. Almost none of them known in our lifetime, some of them perhaps not well known even in their own lifetime, and yet God used them. A reminder of what Paul the Apostle would later write, that not many wise, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. A biblical reminder that nobody in this room tonight is too poor, too simple, too plain, too uneducated, too unskilled, too untalented, too obscure to be used in the hand of God. It is also a reminder to us that at the end of life, whether you're famous or infamous, whether you're well-known or obscure, the only thing that will ultimately matter Are you rightly related to the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, the one known to cherubim and seraphim alike, heralded as he stepped into this world, not to rub shoulders with the aristocrats and the blue bloods, but to hang out with carpenters and fishermen, not to be born in a palace, but to be born in a stable, not to live in wealth, but in poverty, to be raised in a place that was itself the subject of derision. I mean, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I'm talking about a king who was as comfortable with harlots and thieves and prostitutes as he was around those who claimed to be righteous. And as I look at this list, I'm just reminded the only way to get on that list, you've got to be connected to Jesus. And if you get connected to Jesus through the message of the gospel, I'm talking about grace and repentance and faith, nothing else about your past matters one iota in the presence and the sight of God. What amazing love. The marvel about the folks on the tree. Now, I've shared with you before that when I was in high school and college, I worked as a, then we called him a disc jockey uh, at a country radio station. And we would bring all these big name artists to town, to Valdosta, and sponsored some in Tallahassee and Thomasville, Albany. Because of that, when I was in my younger days, I met a lot of what would be famous country singers. And so I've been on the bus with people like George Strait and Ricky Skaggs, Reba McIntyre. Now, that doesn't impress me, so it ought not impress you. I'm not trying to impress you, although I was trying to impress my girlfriend at the time. (laughs) But I've got pictures and signed autographed pictures uh, somewhere at my house up in the attic. But if you were to ask me, how, how'd you get on George Strait's bus, George Strait? How'd you get on Reba McIntyre's bus, Reba? How'd you get on the bus with Ricky Skaggs? Ricky Skaggs took me on his bus. I say all of that to say, how are you going to get on a list like this? you got to have somebody who can take you. And by grace, God sent someone to help us and to place us on this list. Whether they're kings or patriarchs or prophets, they're on this list for one reason. They're connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. Harlots, thieves, liars, murderers, scoundrels, and drunks, all here for one reason. They were welcomed into the family of God by the only one who has the right and the prerogative to welcome anyone into his family. And he says, any who will come to me, come. And if anyone will come, I will by no means cast him out. The marvel about the folks on the tree. Secondly, I want us to consider the majesty of the forks in the tree. As we see this family tree branch out in different directions, it's a picture of the majesty and the providence of God. 
Now, you and I cannot control the family into which we are born, but Jesus can. And Jesus did. Listen carefully. His sovereign control over every aspect of his own family line is a sermon in itself. But as we watch these branches fork off and split off in different directions, it is a glorious reminder of the majesty of his superintending providence over every aspect of the plan of redemption. He's like a divine arborist. Our God is overseeing the protection and the preservation of his own family tree. Let me show you what I mean with two simple things. In these forks of this Christmas tree, there is an undeserved selection. By that, I do not merely mean how did they get on this tree. We know that came by grace through faith. Listen to, listen to the question. Not, not how did they get on this tree, but how did they get on this tree? I mean, with the billions upon billions of fallen sinners, even up to that point in human history, why these? I mean, we know that nobody can get in this family line except by grace, but, but I mean, why these specific ones? Why were they selected by God? And the answer for the individual one is the same answer we would give on the whole. It's by the undeserved, unmerited favor and grace of God. There's nothing about any of these people that they did to earn a place on this list. They are here not because of who they were, but because of who God was, is, and evermore shall be. The bottom line is God chose them to be in His family. Now, if you know anything about ancient history and even modern genealogical records, we tend to trace our bloodline through the firstborn. But I remind this congregation tonight, Abraham was not the firstborn. Isaac wasn't the firstborn either. Neither was Jacob. Judah. I'm talking about Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He was fourth born in his family. David was the youngest of the bunch. Seven brothers passed by him first. Solomon wasn't even David's firstborn. And yet this list shows us something very interesting about God. That is, God is doing whatever He pleases. And He doesn't answer to anybody else for doing what He wants to do. These divine prerogatives go with the office of God. In fact, I would contend that if you can't just do whatever you want to do and speak everything out of nothing, then you're not God. And by the way, that excludes everybody in this room tonight. Romans 9, beginning in verse 11, is where the Apostle Paul comments on this truth I share with you now. He was describing how God chose Jacob over Esau even before they were born. And the Scripture says, For though the twins were not yet born and had not yet, not yet done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to His choice would stand... Not because of works, but because of him who calls. That's why it was said to their mother, the older will serve the younger. Now this unconditional selection of Jacob, not based on his works, but based on the sovereignty of God, is a reminder, I say it again, that God saves people according to who he is, not according to who they are. And if you understand nothing else about the unconditional, undeserved mercy of God, understand this. Nobody, nobody, listen church, nobody deserves to be on this list at all. So rather than being upset that some are on the list and others not on the list, we should marvel in the mercy of God that anybody could ever get in the bloodline of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they got on this list because of what Jesus had done. And you may... Ask yourself, what, what have I done to deserve that kind of mercy? Absolutely nothing. That's why we call it mercy and grace. There's an undeserved selection. But note with me also what I will label an unyielding sovereignty. The sovereignty of God is relentless in protecting and preserving 
the genealogical record of our Lord. The Hebrew Old Testament, their scriptures, our Old Testament, has the same books that we have in our Old Testament, but they are in different order. The Hebrew Old Testament concludes with the books of Chronicles, not Malachi, as does our Old Testament. Equally inspired, they just had the canon laid out in a little different order as far as how the books were laid out. And there is deep significance in that for our purposes tonight. Because Chronicles, as the name implies, is the recording, it's the listing, it's the chronicling of the history of the nation of Israel. And much of that record, much of that list, much of that chronicling involve genealogical records. You may remember during our studies of Ezra and Nehemiah, drawn from that same time period, that those books had as one of their primary purposes to remind the nation of Israel that during the days, the, the decades even, of Babylonian captivity, God had preserved the line of David. That there was a written record that these were the descendants, on one hand, of Abraham that we might call the redemptive line of the Messiah, and David that we would call the royal line of the Messiah. And though much had been destroyed, though much had been torn down and burned and carried away in captivity, there was still a trustworthy record that the one who would come born of the Virgin Mary, he was indeed the son of David and the seed of Abraham. And the people to whom Ezra wrote were fresh back from Babylonian captivity and they were already wondering, is now the time that God is going to fulfill his kingdom? And they were wondering, is there a king that's going to come to fulfill the Davidic covenant? And God gave them some instructions about how to usher in the coming of the great son of David, the Lord Jesus. But listen, it did not involve building a throne. He told them to reconstruct a temple. It didn't involve finding a crown. God instructed them to rebuild the altar and begin making some sacrifices because this king that was coming would have a kingdom that was unlike any dynasty that had ever come before. And Ezra was reminding Israel, as I remind you tonight, that even when our sins require the discipline of God, and in their case there was civic discipline upon the nation, the Davidic line is still in place, and they could trace the royal family line all the way back to King David. And then, I told you that's, those are the last books of the Hebrew Old Testament. So following that, 400 years of total silence as far as a revelation from God. When is he going to come? Some began to wonder, now with Roman oppression and captivity, has the messianic line been snuffed out yet again? When all of a sudden the voice of an angel breaks through the silence and light illuminates the darkness and Gabriel shows up to an unsuspecting virgin teenage girl and says you're going to have a son and he will be great and will be called the son of the most high God and listen to what that Jewish little girl heard and he will sit on the throne of his father David David, David, an angelic reminder that the bloodline is still intact and God has been sovereignly overseeing the whole thing. So to a Jewish audience that was looking for the Messiah, that would be a son of David and a seed of Abraham, I think it is powerful how Matthew begins his gospel. Look at it in verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of of Abraham. This list is a reminder that in the end God will do what God wants to do and everything that he has promised or decreed will come to pass. 
Brothers and sisters, that's true in my life and your life too. God is able, just like He does in this genealogical record, He can take the good and the bad and the ugly and He can weave them into the tapestry of His own sovereign will for our life and no person, no government, no power, not even hell itself can thwart the redemptive purposes of God. The marvel of the folks on the tree. The majesty of the forks in the tree Thirdly and finally, the Messiah at the focus of the tree. Now we all know this family tree is about a king. There's reference to royalty throughout this list. But although there are several dozen names in the branches of this tree, this tree is ultimately about the righteous branch, the Lord Jesus. For these verses, like all the verses in the Bible, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, are really all about one name. The name that is above every other name. And I'll show you that in two simple ways. This list, first of all, tells us about the gift that was given. The gift that was given. Notice how the record begins. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And then at the end of verse 17, from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. This list begins and ends with Jesus. If you're familiar with the Gospel of Matthew, it is written to a primarily Jewish audience to show that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah and the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. And that's why you find so many Old Testament quotations in Matthew's Gospel with reference to the fact that this was done to fulfill what was spoken by such and such a prophet concerning the Messiah. And they knew that the Messiah had to be a descendant of both Abraham and David. Now, why is that? Well, it's because first, the Abrahamic covenant. We find in Genesis 22, verse 18, God said to Abraham that in your seed, notice that word seed is singular. I'll comment more on that in just a moment. In your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This was a promise from God given to Abraham at the top of Mount Moriah when he had offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Paul comments on this promise in Galatians 3.16, one of the great 3.16s of the Bible. There the apostle says, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And then Paul adds a commentary. That God does not say, and to seeds, plural, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is, Christ. In other words, when Abraham raised the knife of sacrifice for Isaac and God called his attention to the ram caught in the thicket and God promised that he himself would provide himself a lamb as a sacrifice, God told Abraham exactly or prophetically how it was going to happen. And I just want to point out that God to Abraham was not merely promising salvation, he was promising a savior. He wasn't merely promising salvation a pardon. He was promising a person. Someone is going to come. And the fulfillment of that promise is the subject of this month's memory verse. Why would God do that? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever would believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. This genealogical record is a reminder that the plan to send Jesus into the world goes all the way back to Abraham, listen, and far, far, far beyond. In fact, this plan goes all the way back to before the foundation of the world. The gift that was given that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, for tonight, we see the God that is glorified. For when you see this tree as a tree of grace, the undeserved favor of God, then you see it is also a tree of glory. For not one branch on this Christmas tree deserves to be there except for the grace of Jesus Christ. For His bloodline, His record begins and ends the same way salvation does with Jesus. Because the ultimate purpose of redemption is is the glory of God and the exaltation of His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, in conclusion, this tree tonight points us to a different tree. This tree, genealogically, is significant because of the tree called Calvary. 
For as they would take our Lord and nail Him to Calvary's cross on a dark Jerusalem hill, it is there that the promised Son of God would lay down His life for our sin, my sin and your sin. And He would pay that penalty. He would drink in the cup of sin and death and He would drink it and drain it dry in order that He might bring many sons and daughters to glory. Tonight I close with this thought. You may not have made that family list. But you can still make God's family list. And the way that you make that list is the same way they made this list. The marvelous, boundless, endless, saving love of Jesus Christ. So tonight as we close, even gazing briefly at this tree tonight, should buckle our knees crucify our pride and call us this Christmas season to cry out glory to God in the highest. John MacArthur comments here that the genealogy of Jesus is a beautiful testimony to God's grace and to the ministry of His Son, Jesus Christ, the friend of sinners. If He, speaking of Jesus, has called sinners by grace to be His forefathers, Should we be surprised when he calls sinners by grace to be his descendants? The king presented here is truly the king of grace. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, where Pastor Mike Stone is committed to walking you verse by verse through the books of the Bible. You can contact us through our church website at ebchurch.net or visit PastorMikeStone.com. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of the Emanuel Pulpit.